back down to that one day. I can say that I could I probably make my flyer down into Bruce Hall yeah. and work it. Yeah. couple of times already, but yes, we could. <laughs> Done? Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome back to, um, I think that was part two of your brainstorming time and, and thinking about it. Hopefully that started to give you some framework for what you're thinking about in your TikToks, and now you can, you can engage with the experts in terms of uh, reality checks, what's interesting, et cetera, and going forward. So th this next hour and 15 minutes or something like that is really just for you. So Pat has given them a little bit of, of orientation of where to go, but all three of them would love to help you actually become great uh, HR professionals. So you should feel completely open to You'd be crazy to not take advantage of the opportunity to talk to them in this intimate setting. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Pat Wright. Pat is going to be the moderator of this session. Not that this will need a lot of moderation, I don't think. And um, something to know about Pat, which most of you will not care about ever or know about, but, but Pat was indeed, is one of the world's foremost uh, research experts in the strategic HR field and really, I think, popular at a tremendous degree. So from an academic standpoint, he's, he's heroic. Again, none of you will care about any of that part, but what you should care about is that this whole event was really Pat's, Pat's brainchild for the whole thing. And they're all here because of Pat. And all of the CEHROs that come to this campus come because of Pat. So Pat's pretty important. Pat. <laughs> yeah, so thanks. Um, <laughs> 
and Anthony's full of crap. So, um, yeah, so in, in any case, just uh, he says this is my brainchild. This is not my brainchild. So just to go back to the history of this, uh, Kevin Cox, who is the head of HR at GE, was visiting about a year ago. Uh, and we were talking about how what, you know, the, the big, big challenge we have as a profession is getting more and, and better talent into the field. And so as, as all of you guys in the MHR programs know, um, there's a limited pool of talent like you, and all of us programs are fighting over that. Okay, and so what the idea was is how do we get more people excited about HR? Because if they knew about it, they'd want to be um, thinking about majoring in HR as undergrads, going to MHR programs. And so we said, well, we're th thinking about doing interviews with CHROs, videos, putting them out online. And Kevin Cox goes, why not TikTok? I mean, that's where everybody is now is TikTok. I do it with TikTok. And so when Tim came through with the, uh, the money to support this, um, th that was the genesis of the TikTok idea. And so again, keep in mind, our goal here is that you guys develop TikToks that go worldwide, and all of a sudden we have thousands of people that decide they want to enter MHR programs because it is such a cool profession. So what we have here today is a panel of three of the coolest in the profession. Um, and I'll introduce each one. Uh, th these are all CHROs and one retired CHRO. Um, but from the leading companies, uh, retired as of June, so it's not like she's outdated or anything at this point. Um, but in any case, you know, these are the, the leaders, and again, all three of these are, are uh, viewed as leaders within the CHRO community, the uh, great companies. Um, they know a lot about the profession, and they know why it's a profession that should be uh, one that everybody wants to pursue. So I'm going to begin with a couple of questions, but you guys need to be asking them questions, okay? And not just, you know, certainly about the field, but about your own career aspirations, things you can do, and um, so on, because they've really kind of reached the peak uh, within the profession. So I'll, I'll start at the end and introduce Pam Kimmett. Pam is uh, the Chief Human Resources Officer at Manulife. Uh, Pam was a CHRO at Cardinal Health before that, at Coca-Cola Enterprises before that. Um, was it Bear Stearns before that? Um, she was actually there for the Bear Stearns um, implosion. So yeah, um, so she's gotten to go through a lot. Um, and she's the, are you still the chair, vice chair at HRPA? What the, was your? The chair. chair. Chair of HRPA. So HRPA, uh, Human Resource Policy Association, is the Association of Chief Human Resource Officers. So that's kind of the, again, pinnacle. Um, in any case, so we're glad she came down today. Uh, Tim Richmond, you already met, CHRO at AbbVie. Um, and he, he talked about his career in the past, but again, Tim is the chair of our advisory board, um, and he is the reason that we have the money to fund this event today by his decision. Um, you haven't met yet Marsha Avedon. Uh, so Marsha was the CHRO at Merck. Uh, then she was the, the CHRO at Ingersoll Rand. And then when Ingersoll Rand went through some kind of a weird split. She knows the name for it. There's some legal term for it. Uh, but they split off Ingersoll Rand um, from Train Technologies, and she became the CHRO at Train Technologies, where she's been um, until about June of this year when she retired. Uh, she's also on the board of directors at Generac and also at Acuity Brands. Um, so, you know, interesting background for all three of them. And the first question, I'm going to start with Pam, and we can work our way this way. The first question I have for them, and I only got two, and then it's up to you. Um, I'll be here with the mic, so you know, raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic to you to ask the question. But the first question is, Pam, why did you get into HR to begin with? Okay, well, first off, it is terrific to be here with everybody. I have not been back on campus in a couple of years, so this was really wonderful when I landed this morning and got to be back here. I always have such a terrific time, and I'm sure today is gonna be uh, very much the same thing. And uh, through dinner, and I'm super excited to see your TikTok videos as well. So uh, I tried to do one with my own team. We need a lot of training. We couldn't even move in a coordinated way. So I'm sure yours are gonna be way better than some of the things we've experimented with. So the seminal question of why did I end up in HR? 
kind of an odd path, really. I was quite convinced from the time I was younger that I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, probably watched too many TV shows and other things and decided, boy, that was great, and I was going to avenge rights and you know, be this uh, really important uh, advocate for people. And so during college nights, I went around to learn about good pre-law curriculums, and a couple people turned me on to this thing called industrial and labor relations. I'm like, well, what's that? And so I learned a little bit more about it, and I went down to Cornell, sorry, competing school, um, and uh, learned a bit more there and really got kind of hooked on it. Ended up going to Cornell, um, gratefully, and uh, had some cool summer internships uh, at General Motors. And I learned, wow, maybe I'd rather go get an MBA later. Maybe I don't want to be a lawyer. Maybe there's some really interesting work that I can do. Uh, did labor relations one summer, did some employee relations benefits, recruiting another summer, et cetera. So it was a very accidental path for me. Now, I still have the secret desire maybe to go back to law school, and who knows, you know, what the heck, I could always do it, I guess, when I retire. I'm not sure what I'd do with it. Um, but I have not regretted it for a second, because um, as we'll talk about today, it's opened up such a variety of things. As Pat said, I've worked across multiple um, industries. I've worked across multiple roles. I've worked in really good business times. I've worked in really bad business times. And so the variety of things that we get to do do is so cool because you're always feeling challenged and you're always feeling that you're really integrated with what's happening in the world. You know, think now, what's in the news all the time? Hybrid work and returning to the office and the role of the office. We're transforming the way we're all working and that's a step change for society, right? So we're always at the vanguard of that. So anyway, those are a few tidbits about how I ended up in this chair. Thanks, Pam. Glad to be here with you today and Marcia with you as well. Uh, you heard a lot from me today, so I'll try and be brief uh, on, my, on my responses beyond the question. The idea of getting into HR really didn't come to me until I was in graduate school. I, I was an RA in a dorm at the University of Minnesota. And if you say Minnesota, people believe you that you're from there. Uh, I'm from there. Um, so I had been at Minnesota. I was an RA in, in a dorm. And my dorm director said, you know, you can go to graduate school. They'll pay for your graduate school if you be a graduate advisor in, in a dorm. And so I, I got uh, offered to be a graduate assistant at Michigan State and uh, started thinking about, well, what program should I go into? And uh, I heard about this labor and industrial relations program that tells you a little bit of the age of when I joined uh, the yeah, workforce, definitely. right? Because of course, no one calls it that anymore. But that, that was the genesis of Michigan State's program, truly a labor relations program with the auto industry around them. And so I, I jumped in with this labor and industrial relations uh, degree program, and I just will admit, you know, uh, which candor sometimes is helpful, I had no idea, like no idea. I, I'm not sure I knew what it was. I, it sounded kind of interesting. I had met some people who told me what they do. I found that a little bit intriguing. And so a little bit of the story is just good fortune, right? Good choice, good program, and a lot of good luck along the way. Uh, and so for me, it was jumping into that program, learning about this field that I learned more about while I was in the program and then getting hired coming out of it like I described here this morning. But uh, really a fortuitous path. Started back being an RA in a dormitory. Hi everyone, it's so great to be with you. I am just excited to be part of this. Uh, it's nice because each one of us has a little bit of different why, you know, why we're in HR. I will tell you that um, all the way back to my like senior year in high school, I took a psychology class, which they had in my high school, and I thought, I really like this. I find this interesting learning about, thinking about why people behave the way they do, what motivates people to do certain things. I know many of you probably were psych majors undergrad. So I thought, I want to study psychology. So I went to undergraduate at University of North Carolina and not too far from here, a competitive school to here. And um, I was a psych major, loved it. I think I took like way more classes than you were required. I was, you know, the psychi president and da, da, da. I was totally, and I wanted to go to graduate school for psychology. End of story, that's what I wanted to do. Meanwhile, I had a father in business who, and then, my boyfriend, who subsequently became my husband, was a business major, business guy. But I will tell you, I graduated, undergraduate, I couldn't have told you what human resources was. Nope. 
didn't hear about it, didn't know what it was. It probably was personnel back then or something. But, but anyway, I didn't know what it was. It w had no aspiration. I did have. A, I did think about law school, but I had some good guidance from professors in the psych department, and I did take an industrial organizational psychology class. And the professor there was one that was kind of fond of me, and I knew him well. And he said, have you thought about, because I thought I would do clinical. Everybody in psychology thinks they're going to do clinical, right? And I did one internship at um, a mental health institute that was scary, like really a state institution was horrible. It was a horrible place. Um, I thought, well, maybe that's not for me, you know? And, um, and then I worked with kids, and I thought, well, I'm going to be a child psychologist. And I was sort of on that path for a little bit in college. And then taking industrial organizational psychology, I said, well, this is cool. I know a little bit about business from all my family and friends. And it kind of was that intersection between psychology and business. And I thought, OK, and people aren't as sick, and you don't have to work in state institutions that look like prisons. So I like, OK, maybe this is good. And so I went on and went to graduate school for industrial organizational psychology at George Washington University and I, in DC. And I went straight through and got a master's and a PhD. And even when I started in the workforce, my internships and then my full-time work, I still thought of myself, my identity was I'm a psychologist. Like I'm, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, but I'm a psychologist. If you would have asked me, I never would have said I'm in HR, I'm an HR professional. I started out in consulting with Booz Allen in Hamilton, and all the people around me were business people. They weren't psychologists, and I suddenly found myself in this world of HR. But I didn't, again, it wasn't like an intentional choice. It was um, sort of a, a roundabout, and I started out much more as a specialist, which is many of... The other people in HR started out in more generalist roles and then perhaps specialized, perhaps didn't. But I was a specialist for many years, like 10 years probably into my career. So that's my story. Okay, so thanks. Um, and it's interesting because you talked about labor and employment relations and personnel being the old terms. So again, thinking about the evolution of the field, um, when you went into the field of HR or personnel or whatever it was at the time, um, how would you describe the HR function in terms of its kind of credibility, reputation in the organization, um, kinds of activities that HR did at that time, and then how has that changed over time? So Marsha, I'll start with you and go with the other direction this time. Yeah, I, I guess a couple things come to mind. So my first um, in-house job was at Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, Missouri, at their headquarters. That was after I came out of consulting, six years in consulting where you saw many, many companies. But when I went inside, I was in sort of this like internal consulting group that was doing organization development, leadership development, et cetera, at the corporate level. But all the people, and we were sort of a specialty little, now we'd call it a COE, a center of expertise. We didn't call it that back then. But then everyone else in HR typically were um, focused primarily on labor and on kind of benefits administration, compensation administration. And there was even the idea of a generalist didn't really exist at that point. So it was much more administrative. We in our little specialty group kind of honestly looked down our nose at those people that did that work. And um, it, it just looked very administrative and very um, back office and all those e expressions. Um, I will also mention that it was almost all men. And because the labor side of it, which was seen as where like the real, the real HR people worked or the real personnel people worked in labor, right? That was kind of the prestigious part because that's where a lot of money was at stake, right? If you got a good negotiation. But they were all men, and we were talking about HR Policy Association. I remember going in my mid-career to the first HR Policy Association meeting that was opened up to people who weren't chief HR officers. It was their um, Washington meeting. And at that time, it was a labor organization. And I walked in, it was a sea of men in dark suits and white shirts, and there were almost no women. And one person we both, knew, we all know, Eva Sage Gavin, who used to be the CHR of The Gap and then recently has been at Accenture. She literally ran up to me and hugged me and said, oh, it's so nice to see another woman here. So when I think about both the work and the composition of the people in HR, 
in the 35 plus years I've been in the field, it's changed tremendously. And luckily for me, as the field grew and became more strategic and more interested in things about talent management and succession and development and those sorts of things, those are the things, of course, as an IO psychologist I studied, I cared about, um, as well as compensation. I did a lot like, like, <laughs> like Pam in compensation, but at a more strategic level, the field kind of emerged and kind of, um, as I grew, the things the field valued became more aligned with what I valued, and suddenly HR was much more, well, that's what I do, you know, that's what I'm interested in, and that's what I can add value. So some of those more um, administrative things became more automated, automated and outsourced. We went through a big outsource phase in the field. And so what was remaining was more strategic and more um, really about development and talent and the things that, that I found very exciting. Yeah, just to build on Marsha's comments, I, I absolutely saw this transformation. Back when I first started, there was still this talk about, did HR have a seat at the table? And I'll just say, thank goodness we don't have to have that discussion anymore. First of all, I didn't enjoy that conversation. I was fortunate, as I described earlier, to work for a great company where that wasn't a question. But that was a question in the field yeah. still. Uh, I also think, too, that, like you said, I think there was this idea that you would have these people in the field that were HR generalists, and it was kind of this, we do all for you. I think the special uh, specialty elements of HR really have evolved in a good way. It's the higher value offering that we have. So you have business partners now, but these COEs that are specialty areas have really grown in importance. Um, I, I shared uh, what our CEO has prioritized for me, but like he, he couldn't care less about the administrative things. Right? It's culture and talent, right? Are you delivering those? The rest of it, I know you, like we run payroll, no one cares. Like just the, the more strategic part of HR exists, the real criticality of the role. It's been a nice evolution and I think uh, I would say Pam and Marsha, Pat, others have made real strides for all of us that we all benefit from. This idea of that kind of cohort of leaders at that time who really reframed HR as a profession will serve you really well. I mean, it's a great time, as I said earlier today, a challenging time, but a great time to join the field. I, I could just say ditto, ditto, ditto. The, the whole point about seat at the table, that was the drumbeat when I was first out of university is, you know, are you going to be in a role where you could have a seat at the table? And meanwhile, Marsh is right. We spent a ton of time doing forms and benefits and onboard processing and other things. I was fortunate enough to do some talent acquisition work, and so I was responsible for uh, hiring um, summer interns, co-op students, and full-time hires. And it was quite a big, robust engine back then because back then you started your career with a company and you were supposed to stay there forever, right? So, so you can imagine an organization as large as General Motors, we were hiring thousands of engineers every year. So that was big stuff. So that was at least sort of interesting to get connected into the business. I was, I was providing a services uh, that leaders wanted because they wanted help and they wanted people, arms and legs, to do the work. Um, but that was, that was the real focus for almost a decade, I'd say, frankly, a bit of a neurotic kind of period for the function is how do we break through? And I can think of one professor that I had in um, undergrad. It was a master's level class that I'd taken, and it was in HR strategy. And that was such a foreign concept because those kinds of things were not discussed by senior leaders. And the final thing, too, which is not a surprise being in the automotive industry where I started, and I was there for 14 years, labor relations had such a big you know, overhang on the company, right? It cast a shadow on everything. And so indeed, it, even symbolically, there were two heads of HR at General Motors. There was a senior officer of labor, there was a senior officer over the rest of HR things. The senior officer of labor had a much bigger office, with two more ante rooms and additional people to get to him than the other person. So it, it was just rather interesting. Now the other person had actually come from Harvard and was a professor there and was really quite capable and hard to work for. But it's just rather interesting how the how the function evolved. And I, I would say too that the thing that Marsha really pulled on is you know, as society changed, as expectations changed about people wanting to command worth for their efforts, right? So pay started to go up. Well, then attention started to get 
get put on pay levels. And then there were political overlays about highly paid people and needing to have more transparency, proxy revisions and other things that started to make people realize, board members and senior managers, hmm, we need some people who are gonna preside over this kind of work. And I know that was a seminal point for me. Uh, I actually, ironically, this was not part of HR at GM, it was part of finance. So I was moved to the finance ta uh, staff, the treasurer's office in particular, because they served as sort of the staff to the CEO. And that's where executive comp plans were designed. And that's when General Motors owned everything from Hughes Aircraft to EDS, a whole suite of mortgage companies, insurance companies, reinsurance companies, auto financing uh, companies, and then had interests in several other uh, joint ventures with Toyota and uh, uh, Super, or excuse me, um, uh, now I'm forgetting the net, Saab and so forth. And so as a result, I got to design pay plans across this portfolio of organizations. I got to start to connect with leaders on a business level and learn about their business and their goals and the problems they were trying to solve. And that became a real gateway, I think, for folks like myself to then be able to demonstrate our worth in a different way and also for us, I think, to find how exciting the profession could be and how it could evolve. Pam made me think of one more thing, and then we're going to open it up, I think, to you all in your questions. But one of the other things when I think about the evolution of the field and, um, and over the 35 years that I've been thinking about it, and even when I think myself about originally being a psychologist, it was very individual focused back in the day. So the idea of employee relations or that HR is somehow an employee advocate was the terminology back in the day and that you know, employee relations representing the employee's views and so forth, and that was sort of it. Do the administrative work and represent employees and, and the business side of it was, was quite small in terms of the, the focus. And so not only this, why we had this like seat at the table thing is we, the field was not seen as a business function, right? Where finance or treasury, as mm -hmm. Pam said, was seen as a business function. Mm -hmm. And I think when I think about HR now and why, how far we've come, I, I wrote an article once about this, but we now can impact four levels. So we still care about the employee, right? The employee experience, we would call it now, or engagement or whatever. But we also care about team effectiveness and how do we make teams really work. We care about, of course, the organizational success overall and all the metrics and things that define organization effectiveness, organizational performance. But now we also have an impact on society, right? So I think the, the field over these 30 some years has gone from largely administrative and perhaps employee advocate, employee focused, to really having the opportunity to impact people, teams, organizations, and society. And we can talk a lot more about, well, how do we do that? One of the coolest things about chief HR officer jobs is you really do have these opportunities to impact either through your company or through consortiums that we've all been involved with, really important societal matters like diversity, equity, and inclusion, or, or other matters uh, related to compensation and so forth, where you're impacting the entire, perhaps country, industry, et cetera, and that's really cool that HR now has that level of influence as opposed to being an administrative back office function. So. Okay, I've got a question over here. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Oh, that's loud. Um, so, you know, as this is a future of HR uh, conference, kind of what do you think HR's next big challenge is in like the next five years and what steps can we take to best prepare ourselves to be able to handle that for wherever we go to work? Good question. Do you want to start, Pam? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Let Pam start. No. Um, <laughs> I think that is actually something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. This is the time of year. If you're at a company that's on a calendar year, fiscal year, you're always thinking about your strategy for the next year, and you're usually drawing a thread to the multiple years out. And I'd say, having lived through the pandemic the last couple of years, there's an awful lot of seminal things that we're trying to decide. Um, top of the tree is really recognizing the power of talent. That's the true differentiator for any of us in our organizations. You know, we were talking earlier today before the panel kicked off, and 
You know, most of our companies, any large company you're going to be affiliated with, if that's the path you choose, they have access to the same technology, the same AI, the same kinds of core tools. So the real differentiator is how do you get the right talent for your organization, put them together, as Marcia said, in the right way so that the people can really be effective, can operate in line with values or principles that don't derail your company, um, and then produce, out sort of execute the competition and produce things that customers want and want to have more of and keep staying with you, right? So talent is the top of the tree. And I think the difficulty, to be honest, is how do we get smarter about talent? Because I don't think AI is the answer. Um, and so how do we really know about talent? There's this plethora of um, focus on tools to break down everybody's skills, right? And um, I think it's an extension of the sort of social era we live in. You know, I'm proficient at this and this and this and this and this. So there's this belief that we can break all of us down into a manifestation of all the skills we're good at. So then we can be super smart about now we have these jobs and we can get this person to do this project, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure that really works practically, but there is a thread in there that we have to unpack to really help people navigate their career and choose to stay with us versus go, since they have so much fluidity. And they, we have to keep thinking about how do we up our game in giving people um, reasons to stay with us because they're excited about what they're doing. So that is sort of at the top for me. It's flanked by something at the other side, which is this curation of your culture. And there's so much voice out there. Everybody wants to speak up and speak out about things. On the one hand, that's wonderful, right? I think it's great that we all have channels and mechanisms to say what we believe in and what we stand for. The difficulty for us is when you're thinking of all the stakeholder groups that you have to consider, how do you navigate that in a way that stays true to your culture, doesn't alienate your customers, doesn't alienate your investors or other interested stakeholders, but allows you to hold your head high, that you haven't just you know put your head in the sand and ducked an issue, and make sure employees feel a sense of pride and commitment or prospective people say, I want to affiliate with you. Those are two big issues that are sort of you know on my mind. And I'm going to do my best not to replicate answers. I really like Pam's answer. We talked about that a little bit this morning, right? This idea of you have to win in the talent marketplace. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, again, if you're going to go out to the market with average talent, you're going to only have so much opportunities to win and be effective. And I think Pam's right. That, that's the key differentiator. I also think she's correct that culture is the winning answer uh, to how you hold on to the most, as we talked about. I would say ditto. Talent and culture and, and making those differentiated from the other companies that people can choose to work for. And I think I heard a statistic. I think it was from Willis Towers Watson a, a week or so ago. For every uh, job seeker right now in the U.S., there are three open jobs. You know, so it, now there's passive people that aren't looking, but for people who are actively looking, there's there's right now three open jobs. So the the you know the situation for HR, and I think it won't change in the next few years dramatically, in my opinion, just because of the demographics and, and you know things like technology and and automation take a long time to really um, displace large numbers of people. I think that um, that that talent war, as we like to call it, it is not going to change. But I think um, it's easy to say it's talent and culture. I think it's really hard to be differentiated. And I'm always amazed at like, you know, now, as Pam said, now everybody's using one of two HR systems. You know, it, it's either Oracle or it, it's Workday, right? So that part of the employee experience is exactly the same, mm -hmm. right? It's just exactly the same. So the culture, the purpose, the effectiveness of leadership, those are the things that actually make an experience differentiated. And think about it for yourself. You know, it's development, right? It's like, where am I actually going to go and learn and be treated well and feel like I'm valued, like I really am a critical resource in the organization? So those are the sort of softer things um, in terms of 
the culture and giving people a sense of meaning, right? And those are hard to do it across, you know, 50, 60, 80,000 people in our organizations. Okay, I think I have the next question. So in my view, culture really is at least strengthened a lot by institutional knowledge. In a time where the expectation is not that you'll come and work for a company for your entire career, it's really hard to hold on to talent, and where the way we work is changing, how do you protect your culture and keep it from being eroded? You know, maybe I'll, I'll build on that right off the bat on some things we talked about earlier today, and that's why I think a little discipline and a little rigor to the process, right? And maybe you'll be with us for a short time, but you're going to learn about how we do things here. I think those here's how it's done in our company versus someone else, but we're gonna, we're gonna teach you and we're gonna reinforce what we want from you, but also what we wanna reward for you. What I, the, I've heard people say before like, oh, well, then you need to like, think of that person like a rental and, then, and manage them appropriately, and I'm like, I really don't wanna start down that path, right? I just don't think that's the right way to do it. Um, and if someone has a short-term mentality, I don't wanna distract from my long view on talent and culture with short-term strategies to meet a short-term uh, employee? Uh, that's just my first reaction to that question. It's a very good one, but I, I'm gonna stay true to what I think is the, is the approach and the reinforcing elements that makes us, to, to Marsha's point, different, hopefully better by being different than people's other choices. I, I, I think, you know, it's all about leadership, right? Like, I think, um, in terms of culture and how do you make it sticky, in my last company, Train Technologies, we just went through a CEO succession uh, about a year ago, and the CEO, in his early days, talked about you know he'd been with the company 35 years, 38 years, I think it actually was, 38 years, and he said I I was a finance MBA, I had tons of choices, I thought I'd do this job for a couple of years and then go to Wall Street and really make money, and you know. Um, and here he was 38 years later and people, young people in the audience asked him, well, what made you stay? And he said, you know, I worked with all these great people. I was always learning and I had great leaders and mentors and I, here I am waking up 38 years later and I'm the CEO, right? Like who could have dreamed it? So um, I think we should all be trying to create cultures where we surprise people and they stay twice as long as they thought or 10 times as long as they thought in, in his case. Right, so I agree, I agree with Tim. We shouldn't look at our employees like we're renting them or someone described a, a culture that I won't say which company, that they treated everybody like they were, a, they were a, a summer associate and they were gonna leave and go somewhere else, right? I don't think we should do that. I think we should design our culture still thinking the, the right people will hopefully stay a long time. Whether they stay their whole career, I'm not naive that doesn't often happen these days. But I do think um, if you can capture people's minds and hearts and keep them longer than your competition, even if it's a few years longer, that's huge competitive yes. advantage, right? So we should design it hoping it's so sticky and so wonderful that it's gonna be really hard to lure them away just with more money because they can always get more money somewhere else. I might just add a couple other things to more tactics to think about that sometimes maybe don't make it to the headline level, but they're really important reinforcers. So first off, you got to have values that you think consciously about the programs and actions you take. Are you living your values? Are you demonstrating your values to people? I would say, for example, for us, the pandemic was such a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate our values very tangibly that it was cementing them. So the drumbeat of messages, reinforcing communications, how we do certain things, keep reinforcing those values. Training programs, really important when people are onboarded or when people make a role change and become a leader that they think about the responsibilities. Performance management, we measure people on what and how because we want to make sure that we're not just a company that you know, praises you because you delivered great numbers, but you did it in the right way. And we go through 360 processes and other things to reinforce it. So even if people are a bit temporal, there's these ongoing processes, rituals, and sort of approaches that keep reinforcing what we want. And then the actual reality is when you get to certain leadership levels, you have a fair bit of stickiness. You know, 80 plus percent of your leaders have some continuity with your company. 
And so they become part of that glue, really, that keeps reinforcing things. But you have to have those other rituals or processes in place, too, to keep reinforcing it and to keep looking at markers, you know, through your listening posts, your engagement surveys, whatever else you do to make sure you're on track. Because even when you think your culture's humming, sometimes you can find pockets where it gets off track or it takes an aspect of your culture and rotates it sort of out around, and now you've got a problem like, you know, trying to drive growth in sales at all costs kind of thing, but you thought you did it the right way. But that's, that's maybe a bit more on the tactical side of how do you make it, you know, keep going. Maybe one more thing to add, because it just, let's all deal with like the first question, the next five years kind of thing. So one thing you're all going to have to confront is this idea of people working more remotely, right? And so particularly for early career professionals, that idea of the stickiness that both Marsha and Pam talked about, it's going to be harder, right? People are, are less physically present uh, and, they're, and they're less often connected with those people that I know that were important early in our careers. Mm -hmm. They're like, wow, I get a chance to interact with this person or the, the, these people, and I'm learning every day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, by the way, in the formality of it, mm -hmm. but just as important in the informality of it. And so that connection with people, it's gonna make it harder, and we have to be more intentional about how we go about helping new uh, graduates, new hires become more connected to our company, our culture, and help them to perform and develop uh, in their careers. I think yeah, it's a great was, question. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, Marsha. No, I was please. just going to ask if anybody had any experiences they wanted to share for your question, too, because we're not the font of all knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> You're being really I was just quiet say, now. <laughs> I was just going to say on the remote work thing, you know, I'm sure you've read all the surveys in newspapers about you know, the CEOs and their direct staff, a lot of them wanted everybody back in the office, right? And you probably thought, well, why do they want it back in the office? Why are they being so old fashioned? I think the even the more enlightened CEOs, it was this. They were worried they didn't have the recipe or know how mm -hmm. to keep the culture healthy if everyone is working from home, all the, the formerly office workers are working from home. I don't think it was they were just trying to be old fuddy duddy stick in the mud. They really were, at least the CEOs I knew, both on the boards I'm on and, and then my company, it was, and they were looking at HR to answer it, if we let all these people work from home indefinitely, like how are, how are we gonna onboard people? How are we gonna get them to feel the culture and have those hallway conversations? So that was what the CEOs were looking at us in HR to say, well, are we going to lose our culture if we let mm -hmm. indefinitely large percentage of the people who aren't direct workers in a factory or in a retail store, if we're going to let all those people work from home? That's why they were concerned about it. Some might have been fuddy daddies, but the majority of them weren't. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, this is very insightful. Um, so thinking about the future of HR, I feel like a big component of it is diversity. Uh, I'm an international student from the Philippines, and I know a lot of international students in, uh, in my program and in other programs too. And during my um, application process for internships, I saw that you know, like most um, uh, opportunities for international students are uh, in STEM. And so um, I just want to know, how do you envision HR um, having a more diverse um, immigrant um, people um, in the next few years? Well, I will first tell you, we have over 8,000 employees in the Philippines, so you might want to come talk to me <laughs> or one of my colleagues later, um, because we have some very cool HR work to do there. But um, I'll let somebody else answer more first. I, I'll just jump in and say, look, I think there's always an issue, and, and a, a tactical one, unfortunately, around uh, the visa issue and, and, and that. Mm -hmm. But I think the best companies say, okay, so what? That's mm -hmm. the that's the process. Mm -hmm. Let's let's manage through it. Go back to what I still think is the the the, the central tenant. Pam started with it. It's all about talent, right? And the talent agenda, and. I talked to you all earlier today about the importance, if you can, living and working outside of your home country. And for some people, that means working here. And the best employers are going to say, again, all I want is my unfair share of the best. And so bring yourself forward, bring uh, capability forward, and the opportunities are enormous, no matter where you start from. Mm -hmm. 
And I would just add, Manulife, many of you probably scratched your head because you're like, Manulife, I haven't heard of Manulife, which is true when I first learned of Manulife myself. I, I wasn't aware of it. Um, in, in America, you would know us as John Hancock, so Americans would probably be bobbing their heads going, okay, heard of that. Uh, in Asia, though, you would, you would know us quite well, actually, yes. Um, but in Canada, being a Canadian headquartered company, we're very open on immigration and uh, visas and other things for us are not an issue. So we have a portfolio of levers between our footprint across Asia and also with our Canadian heritage to do some things sometimes. And so we're really interested in people that want to be globally nomadic because we think that's so important to our future success as an enterprise across the functions as well as our commercial opportunities. So. I don't have anything to add. I'll make one more comment, which uh, is if you're all going to be the best human resources professionals that you can and reach your full potential, one thing you're going to have to be in tune with is if you work with a, a multinational company is to help get out of the, I'll tell you, say I work for a U.S. multinational, as you know, but that we're a U.S.-centric multinational company. Companies at their best are locally competent, and I mean that from a business standpoint, cultural standpoint, talent standpoint. So. That, that's just a little bit check your kind of a, your own kind of unconsciousness to that and become more conscious of it. I think it'll help you be a better professional. I have actually a funny story about that. It, it, so I couldn't agree more with Tim. I'm on the board of um, Generac, which is a generator company. It's a, it's a wonderful company, but it grew tremendously fast from a local Wisconsin-based U.S.-focused company. All their factories were in Wisconsin at that when it was founded. It was a um, founder uh, inventor heritage and it grew like crazy and, and now this year it'll be over five billion dollars of revenue but they're struggling with this now they find themselves a multinational company and at last week I happened to be with them in Italy and the person um, who was the most senior person in Italy happens to run um, all of the Europe, Middle East, Africa, but he has some other jurisdictions. And on all the presentations, and the board just cracked up at this, they kept calling it ROW, rest of world. And now, is that an American-centric? Mm -hmm. Totally. So I, sometimes his title said, you know, President of MIA, Europe, Middle East, Africa. And sometimes it said ROW, and we're like looking at each other, we have got to get rid of that terminology mm -hmm. because it's just so US centric. And so it's, it's easy because language, you know, things creep into the language, become part of the culture, back to rituals, mm -hmm. culture, unintended mm -hmm. consequences, or, or even implicit bias, right? Because that's in fact an implicit bias that. Um, somehow they're the rest of the world. We're, we're here and they're the rest of the world. So we all went back and said to the CEO, you gotta, you gotta get that out of all the documents, right? So it's just a, a great example of what you were saying. And it's unintentional, but that's the roots of the company, right? Um, not only was it not a national company, it was a state, you know, company. So I thought that example was relevant. Yes. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Jolene Morgan. I'm here from Illinois. Thank you guys for coming. I know we were all excited for this. Um, so my question is, you guys touched a little bit um, on kind of how the field has changed. Um, my question is, so I guess, how do you think that you can enhance HR's ability to um, influence and impact? So basically, a little background, I feel like uh, you guys were talking about getting that seat at the table. I feel like how can you be a valued voice at that table as well as um, on the lower levels have employees be willing to come to HR and not just fear HR and kind of realize <laughs> that the talent development capabilities that you have. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I, I like you. You're pursuing both ends of it, which I think is really smart. I would say to, to, to have a sustainable voice at the table for us is that we have to demonstrate that we understand what's going on in our business, that we're able to see patterns, we're able to draw connections across disparate things, and we're able to think about and give voice to ideas that challenge other people's thinking. And, uh, you know, the best compliment I could have gotten, my CEO said recently to me, I always want to know what you're thinking about an issue. I, 
That was very humbling, right? Because he pulls me into a lot of things, which sometimes I'm like, why am I in this meeting? Um, but he wants to know what I'm thinking. And so I, I, I think for all of us, the beauty of our profession is this, this wide swath of things that we get involved in. The responsibility of our profession is to take all of those experiences and to actively think about and also to be plugged into what's going on in the world and why would those things potentially matter for us? How would we think about what we're doing? And I, I think attendant to that, too, is not just being one of these type of people, right? I mean, it's comfortable. It's certainly nice to say yes to folks, and that includes the other end of your question, right? How can you build being a trusted resource? Because sometimes you got to give people an answer they don't want, and that's never fun. I mean, I don't get out of bed every day to go, wow, I can't wait to lay somebody off or tell somebody, sorry, we can't do something for you, right? That's not soul nourishing. But I, I think if you can consistently try to demonstrate fairness, um, accessibility, and trustworthiness, which is always really hard about you know, holding information and managing confidences in the appropriate way, it's, it's fascinating how the undercurrent, like it will, it will show up and people will feel it and they will grow to trust it, but it takes time. There's not any magic thing to say, oh, it's HR and it's great, because you're right, Dilbert and all these other things foster these horrible <laughs> images of come to HR and we will tell you no, right? So uh, you, you've got you've to sort of manage that. But I, I, I think certainly if people like myself can have that, standing with their peers, then it helps my team have more standing with their customers and peers, and it helps people in the company recognize, okay, this organization actually must be pretty good at what they do because they seem to have this standing. So it's a little bit of that virtuous cycle. I don't know if that all made sense. Yeah, just maybe to build on that, you know, I think You've heard this a million times, but really knowing the business, and that work is never done, no matter what role you have and what level you're in. Um, I'm In my, my second act here, I'm coaching a few chief HR officers, and one of them is in an industry that she's never been in before, and her stakeholder feedback is all about that. Like, for you to be credible, we know you had all this experience with these other industries, but for you to be credible, you have to understand our business. And you need to feel what we feel every day in these jobs. And that's feedback both to your second part of your question, to sort of the rank and file, you know, everyday employee in the various jobs, but also the senior management, many of whom have been with that industry and that company for many, many years. So there's a credibility around doing and doing the work to learn the business, right? Not just to have general good business acumen, I assume all of you do, um, but to actually know the jobs and how the work gets done and how the different parts of the business work together and what do our customers really care about and how are we doing against customers' expectations? That level of understanding the business gives you credibility and you can become a PAM where the CEO wants her opinion on everything because you're not just in your swim lane of HR, you're a full business person, then you do have voice at the table, to use your term. Um, I also think there's a interpersonal characteristic of, of having the courage to um, say what you really think or what you really know to be true based on whatever data or information you have. I see too many HR people um, who are either order takers or yes people. And it's not that they aren't smart or they're not well trained. It's an interpersonal characteristic to have the courage to be a coach, be an advisor, um, ask the tough question about, well, why is that the best way to do it? Like sometimes, you know, asking that question or to the point about how do employees broadly trust you. A lot of times, even if it's something they don't want to hear, explaining the why. So I think if we're either asking why, if we're coaching up, or we're explaining why, if we're coaching down in terms of the organization, that, that it, it may not be what they like. You may have to explain why is it fair, or why is it rational, and why should you trust this process? Because there's a lot of skepticism, right? Like big, the big company, right? Like, why should I trust that my pay is correct? Or why should I trust that 
this was done properly. And I think the more you can explain it, take time with people. I loved Pam's word of access. If people feel you're listening and they have access to you, even if what you're saying isn't what they want to hear, I think you, you'll you'll do very well. Um, so my, my two things would be really know the business at a deep level and, you know, ask and explain why would be my two tips on, on that. Listen to those two. That, that was great advice from both of them. <laughs> All right. Hi, um, my name is Kate and I'm a Cornell student. Um, my question also goes around. Um, Had to give a little home team shout out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, all about having a valuable seat at the table. And I know that you all constantly interacting with other stakeholder groups. And you mentioned finance. I know you're probably interacting with CFOs a lot. Um, but um, Marsha, you mentioned how we now have HR it has more of an impact on society. And so that makes me think a lot of ESG and sort of those CSR groups or if maybe that's legal teams. So I'm curious if you, any of you could share any stories with us on specific times around pivotal partnerships you made with other stakeholder groups or business functions um, in order to enact change or in an initiative. I, I'll be, thank you. I'll, I'll be happy to jump in, and I'm sure um, others can add. When we're at our best, I think we're, we're, we're what we've, you've heard a lot from, from us. We're strategic. We're delivering value back to the business. But also when we're really at our best, we can't do our jobs alone. So I think of legal all the time as a partner on governance. Like there's hardly anything we do without governance support, whether it's something for the board or something for our company. But the same is true for finance which is these partnerships are really critical. So you think of like at a company level, there's only so many truly enterprise type functions. It's why your CEOs will value your significant contribution because you're gonna see the whole chessboard like they do. Others typically see their vertical, but who are the other players who have that whole chessboard? It's typically finance and legal. Mm -hmm. And I have from day one tried to emphasize the importance of being good collaborators and I think it's at my level but also my team's level. So when I think of like the most effective people, they do it personally, and get, they get their teams to do the same, which is this is a team sport. A, we're gonna help you, we all win, it's for the benefit of the enterprise. Um, so this, uh, this space of ESG will be a significant part of your careers, okay? I don't think that's going backward. I think you're gonna get lots of help in some cases, you're gonna get lots of support in others, but people are gonna ask, Questions. What's your stance on this? What do you believe about that? What's your emissions? What's your um, sustainability plan? What's your whatever it may be? The fact that you put it all on your shoulders, I don't think is a good strategy. You're going to want to need those partners, uh, and you're going to want to tell a story uh, that's really well-rounded. I don't know. If, I just would assume you'd agree. I mean, I think that partnership's mm -hmm. critical. Yeah, and I, I think creating partnership and coalitions on any major strategy or initiative is a great um, reminder, ESG being one example. But, you know, you take the S, and we probably in HR own the diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion piece of S if it ladders up ESG, S, DEI. You know, even that, which you would say we, we are like the driver of it in many ways, in my many years of working on DEI, the most impactful pieces of those strategies are when you're um, seeing bottom up and you're seeing leaders that aren't in HR owning that initiative, driving it, leading it with you, for you. I will give you an example. You asked for an example. Um, and actually, Pat and I were just talking about um, about this, and, and this is a true story. So I, my company was, um, is, is North America headquarters is in uh, near Charlotte, North Carolina, a couple hours from here. And um, our CEO was overseas doing something when the famous bathroom bill was percolating in North Carolina, which you may remember was a, um, about, you know, transgender issues related to um, same, you know, bathrooms and whether you have a bathroom that is available to people based on, on uh, the, their uh, gender identity. And the state legislature had taken one position and the city of Charlotte took an opposing position and it was quite heated. And um, anyway, our LGBTQ 
um, plus employee resource group, of course, got wind of this. It was not quite in the newspapers yet, but they contacted me. And some people contacted me at the same time, contacted one of our PL leaders, our business leaders, who was our sponsor of that group. We purposely had line people sponsoring that were not members of the particular group. So this is a straight white guy who ran a business for his day job who also was their executive sponsor. So he calls me and CEO's not around, I'm there. And he and he's like, they really want us to be vocal. They want us to take a stand. It's right in our backyard. I did a little networking with my colleagues in other companies and it was so aligned with our values around DEI. And, and it, it was a case where it was really bad legislation, a lot of politics, et cetera, and, and nonsensical. Like I went and read it, it was like nonsensical stuff. And um, couldn't get a hold of the CEO and this PL leader and I looked at each other and said, we've got to make a decision, are we signing on to this or are we not? And we, and we basically contacted them and said, we're signing on. And then the CEO came back and, and we said, this is what we did. And, um, and he was like, well, you did the right thing. Thank you for doing it in my absence. But it was so nice to have a line person there with me, not just me making that call. I would have made the call, back to courage, I would have made the call. But to know another line respected business person in the company was totally with me and all these employees obviously were with us. And so just an example, we're building those coalitions and that happens to be an ESG example. But that point would be on any big strategy, you know, get, get stakeholder involvement. I, I call it co-creation, like co-create it with people that care about it and don't feel like you have to do it all alone. The only thing to add would be, look, how do we all get better at what we do? We're constantly having to challenge ourselves to learn. And I have found that my partnerships with the general counsel or the CFO or the head of IT have been really important ways for me to keep upping my game and understanding things or looking at things from a different perspective. Doesn't mean you always agree, um, but it's really helpful. and. The other side of it is we have to keep a lot of confidences in our role. And it's hard to be able to have some trusted colleagues where you can't tell them everything, but that you can, you can go to them and say, geez, I'm not really sure how to deal with X or I'm confronting Y. You need those partnerships for your own sanity too. So both to learn and also to just sort of stay resilient, make sure that you sense check that I'm not off track or crazy here. That's a good point. Hi. Uh, my name is Olivia Davis. I'm in my final semester here in South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my question related to career aspirations from where you're sitting now in the role that you're in, how do you begin to shift your mindset or what steps you take to shift your mindset to go from like an individual contributor to a people leader? Mm -hmm. Who wants to start? Well, do... <sighs> First off, you have to decide what matters to you. I'll be honest, years ago, if you read my uh, annual appraisals where you had to put in your development goals, I never said I wanted to be in the chair I'm in today. I just like doing good work and feeling like I was accomplishing projects that were given to me. So you have to decide, do you want to be a people leader because it, it a, it's the thing to do, or B, because it gets you more money, or C, because it gets you more maybe prestige, depending on the company you're in, et cetera. The important part is, does it excite you? Do you get excited to put effort into it? Um, because if you're going to do it and be good at it, it's really time consuming. And I would tell you it's probably the hardest tug that I've had over my entire career is, how do you give enough nurturing and coaching and, and time to your team, but then also serve your other stakeholders and also have time to think and create and do and give back to the profession and all the things that make you happy too? So I would just say first, before taking that fork, decide do you like you know, helping people unlock their capabilities? Do you like sort of directing goals and other things? Do you have a little bit of maybe a control but a coaching desire in there? I don't know, but those, those are important things to start to ask yourself. And, and like anything, you, there's ways to sort of to test it. You know, you could lead teams or projects and not necessarily be an official people leader, but you're doing a lot of the things Pam talked about. You're coaching, you're providing direction, you're 
um, you know, you're working and impacting through others, not just on your own work. Mm -hmm. And does that feel inspiring and exciting for you? So you can try it on a little bit by volunteering to lead a project or to lead mm -hmm. an initiative. You probably did some of this in, in all your classes or you mm -hmm. had team projects. And how did that feel if you were sort of playing an official or unofficial leader? You know, is that something that you gravitate to? The nice thing about our field is there are some pretty senior roles you can do that don't require leading a lot of people. Obviously, there's more career opportunities if you do want to lead people, but more and more there's roles that you can do, mm -hmm. consultative type roles, analytical roles, other things that are highly valued in the profession that don't require it. But, um, you know, test it out a little bit. Try it on. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to add just, you know, our different perspectives, you know, like Pam, I, I had no aspiration to be in this role, right? And I think um, it would have been naive if I did. Because first of all, I was just happy to have a job. I remember when I first started, right? I'm like, hey, I got a job, come out of grad school, it's just great. I would have probably started for half the money, right? I probably would have. Um, so don't do things kind of generalized. I wouldn't do it for a title or for, or for the salary. I think one thing that helped me think through early career was this idea was I like learning and growing. And what I meant by that was, was I learning? Was I, was, I, was I experiencing things? And so I was pretty flexible. Some things would be you know, on my list, others were not. Companies come to you, and I think the best companies, again, will help you with that learning process. So that self-discovery comes from that. People leadership ultimately comes from that. Because the other part was the, was the growing. And the growing wasn't level, wasn't like my hierarchy. But the growing was in terms of capabilities. So if I was learning and growing, my, my self-talk was, okay, good, I'm learning, I'm growing. And then to Marsha's point, things will come to you. People will see your capability. They'll see you learning. They'll see opportunity for you. And they're going to help you make that match early on, which is, again, you go back to like, the type of company you start with in your career. Um, they're, going to be, they're going to be a partner with you in that process. They're going to want good things for you. Uh, and I think that's why it's important to really find that right fit when you think about who you're going to work for. I just had one more thing to add about it. You know, it's okay to want to be an expert, right? Like some yes. people get a ton of, you know, a lot of people I went to graduate school with went into academics or they stayed a very narrow specialized area and their satisfaction in their career was being an expert, publishing papers, writing books, being the thought after consultant and some of them very, very successful and they don't lead anybody except themselves and, and ideas, you know. So, um, you know, over time you'll, and by the way, in the first 10 years of my career, I thought that was me. You know, I had small teams of people, but we were all experts, you know, <laughs> like that was what we did. And um, it was probably about 10 years in and I was at Allied Signal, which became Honeywell, and the CEO in a talent review told my boss's boss or whoever it was, you know, I think Avedon has some, some talent. Why don't you move her into a much bigger job? And I guess I was high potential, but I don't know if we called it that at the time. But anyway, and they threw me into my first really big business, what we call now HR business partner role. And I was for the first time sitting at a business table with people in all the other functions and the president of the business and so forth. And after a year or so in, I was like, well, I really like this. Like, I like, I wasn't the expert anymore, right? I was a business person helping run this business, working with all the other functions, and leading, a, at that time, I, I think I had 50 or 60 people around the world, et cetera. It was a global business. And I, I suddenly felt, to your point about learning and growing, like my opportunity to learn and grow went like this, right? And it was fun for me. Um, I don't know if five years earlier someone had said, go do, and it was the most heavily organized part of the company, and they were Teamsters, and it was, it was really rough, rough and tumble, and the business wasn't performing. It was a terrible business, <laughs> but, I, but I actually had an epiphany that I like being a business person first that specializes in HR, and I like leading through people these big organizations, and from then on, I continued to do that in different scope and industries and so forth. But you have to know, it, you know, are you the person like some of my colleagues who loved being an expert and a specialist? Or, or do you like the world of business and leading through others? And, and many times as a leader, you don't know the answer. 
You have no idea because you're not, you're no longer the expert as you move up in leadership. There's other people working for you who are the experts. So it's just how to think about leadership. You're working through others, many of whom are closer to the problems and closer to the processes than you are. And are you going to be comfortable with that? All right, we're moving to the second row tables finally. I was a little worried there. You know, the front row was doing the heavy lifting in this room. <laughs> um, thank you, all three of you, for being here, and um, Dr. Wright for, for moderating. And Tim, I thought your, um, your talk this morning was truly inspiring. Um, so my question may be a bit redundant now that um, my brilliant colleague over there, Kate, um, from ILR school at Cornell um, asked this question about like cross-functional alliances. So I'm super interested in, you know, maybe not even just cross-functional alliances that have um, been really beneficial in your understanding of business needs and goals, but also cross-organizational, potentially like um, I know that Pam is now the chair of the HRPA. Um, and of course, we all are connected to our academic institutions in some way. How have those connections and alliances been mm -hmm. uh, part of your evolving kind of, you know, view and philosophy on HR at your organizations? Well, I, I have to say, um, from the time that I was much earlier in my career, I had the privilege of joining some different groups, like a conference board group on compensation and other things. And those networks and friendships have been enduring over decades and are such an important part of sparking my thinking. I love coming, for example, I love coming here and Pat is amazing and I followed him here from the north. Um, <laughs> but I also got to meet Anthony and DJ and Rob and so many other wonderful um, uh, faculty members here who again do incredible work and really spark your thinking. So to me, like, the excitement, I, I mentioned variety early on about our profession, but there is this responsibility to keep challenging yourself, challenging your thinking, and really that happens when you can be with colleagues and you can talk about issues and somebody can put an idea out there that either confronts you and you go, oh my God, or, or makes you say, oh, why didn't I ever think of that that way? So I think it's immensely important. Yeah, I think probably most of you've read, you know, HR, from the outside in by David Ulrich, you know, I think the best HR executives, including the two sitting next to me, they're outside in people, right? They're, they're building their constant sources of information and insight from outside, not just inside their company. The collaboration is important inside, but the most um, strategic HR leaders that I know are looking outside and part of that and I've also been so fortunate to I guess I'm a little bit of a joiner anyway but I've been involved <laughs> with lots of groups um, over the years and it does stimulate my own learning and insights but also you bring all that back to your organization right so um, I'm always shocked when I meet a young HR professional and they say oh my company doesn't let me go to any conferences I'm like what you know I mean, you don't go to a company that says that, right? So you need to be outside in. You need to be externally aware. We actually had a competency about external awareness. And, um, I, you know, for me, it's actually so fun because you're not only building this great network and friendships over your whole career, but you're constantly learning from other industries, other professionals, getting those ahas that, that Pam talked about. But I, you know, I think we, one more piece is we're elevating the function overall, mm -hmm. the profession mm -hmm. overall, by the great things that Abby's doing, coming to train technologies and that are relevant and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And Manual Life is doing something I'd never thought of before. So we're elevating the total function. And all of us have given back to the function to try to develop the next generation, right? So all of that is the external involvement. And um, for me, it's been part of what has been such a great career. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I couldn't imagine it not being part of my career. But I will tell you, we have to coach the new CHROs to be, because there's so much in the job. And when you're new, it's very easy to be just totally focused on inside and your CEO and your board, and it's all new. And we have to coach them to, to look up, look out, don't just look 
inside the company, so it's, it's a typical learning for senior HR people as well. Again, great advice from both. One thing I will say that's interesting that I've learned over time, outside in, I completely agree, but sometimes, let's go to this topic, it's a little bit different than learning and growing, but like benchmarking, right? So sometimes you'll say, well, let's benchmark what our peer companies are doing, or let's benchmark what a best practice looks like. And there's real value in that. But I'm gonna give you a little nugget, at least that's worked for me, which is sometimes you wanna benchmark because you want to be more like that. You wanna benchmark to be the same. Other times you should benchmark so you can be different. Mm -hmm. Just keep that in mind. Benchmark sometimes to be different. Mm -hmm. Again, what makes you unique? What makes your company unique versus what the consensus is, and there's a real value offering sometimes to know the market and still make a call that's different than that, and there's a rationale for it that's a value creator. That's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Brandon Jackson. I'm a second year at the University of South Carolina. Thanks for being here. Awesome. So a couple of moments ago, you all talked about uh, being a people leader and what that experience is like. So my question is, what is your talent development philosophy and what experiences in your career have helped shape said philosophy? Well, um, that's a really good question because I probably have not been as intentional about it for a long time and then maybe have been more intentional in the latter part of my career, I suppose. <laughs> um, I, I would say back to my, my curiosity and my asking sort of orientation, that's been a big part if I think about the, the many years at the start of my career. I would ask people, what are you doing, or could you help me, or could you explain something, or could you go show me, or could I tag along to a meeting, or could I, could I, could I? And I was fortunate enough that I got to do that a lot. And so that's been an enormous part, because I believe the best learning comes from doing things. You know, I mean, sadly, the best learning I've ever had is when stuff doesn't go the way I thought it would go. <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, they aren't, that, that helps the subsequent times. But, um, but in, in all honesty, I, I think the doing piece is so important. And so if you can observe or help do, um, those are really um, seminal for, for me. I, I'm a reader, but I'm not as voracious as some of my colleagues. Um, I'm more edited in taking you know, things and scanning kind of broader landscape to decide, and then I'll be choiceful about a book or something like that. Um, there's people that I've relied on, and I've been fortunate to, to have as mentors also, um, and I've sustained those friendships, and they've been different, different aspects of why they would be mentors. Sometimes even people that were really hard to work for, but they challenged me in ways that helped frame my thinking so that I could be better and sharper at what I did. So it's really a, a, a portfolio, but I, I have to admit, and I love the fact that you're intentionally thinking about it, because I didn't do that for a long time in my career. It, it, luckily, I had certain attributes that benefited me because I asked a lot of people, hey, what are you doing, and can I go along with you? I just want to double check that we got the question right. Were you talking about how we think about talent development in general or about our, self, our philosophy on talent development in general yeah. or for our own professional development? I just want to make. Oh, in general. In general. My bad. Sorry, F for me. Your answer was still a good one. It was still <laughs> interesting, very interesting. It was. Um, so first thing I would say is that each company has sort of their own talent development philosophy and they create it that's relevant to their HR strategy and their business strategy. So there's not like I think a one size fits all talent development philosophy. I, some what I'll call nuggets or core components. Um, you know, I think for me, there's a piece about providing opportunity for all that it, hopefully you're back to culture and talent being sort of flip sides. If you have a talent development philosophy that there's opportunity for all, you have to you have to earn it, but it's there for everyone. And that's one sort of philosophy I have on, on talent is you have to have a culture where there really is opportunity for all talent to shine and that those opportunities result in um, rewards or opportunities for growth based on um, performance and potential and those sorts of things, but it's there for everyone um, to partake. Um, another thing when I think about talent philosophy, which I think Pam was using herself as a good example, I think that the way people really uh, develop 
is by getting out of their comfort zone and doing things they haven't done before. So the key is there is, is more on the experiential, but also not just keep doing what you've always done, right? Because let's face it, when have you sort of sweated and really like feel like you're using new muscles and all those analogies? It's not when you've done the same thing a hundred times, right? So the same applies to your career, right? So my second sort of talent development is do something you haven't done. And even if you decide you don't like it or you don't ever want to do it again, you've learned something, right, in that process. So, and then oftentimes you learn something about yourself that you didn't realize you had skills and capabilities that you didn't even know. Um, for HR professionals, we were just talking about this. Um, a lot of people maybe didn't come from um, families where they were in a manufacturing environment. So when they tell you in your rotational program, oh, you're going to start out in a factory, and they're like, eh, no, I don't want to do that, you know. And then they, I talked to them six months later, and they loved that rotation. And they learned so much, and they interacted with people they never would have interacted with if they stayed in the corporate office for that year. So my point is just, um, I think the second part of a really good talent development philosophy is, you know, don't hold yourself back by doing what you know you can do well and you're really comfortable with, but take some chances, especially now at this point in your career. Try things you've never thought you would like. If you're, oh, I'm not that good with numbers, I don't want to do a compensation rotation, do it because it'll make you better. You may not end up being the head of total rewards, but you may surprise yourself and you'll have that skill in your repertoire. So I, I guess I would say those would be my top two, you know, the variety and get out of your comfort zone and, and just, you know, um, really making sure if you're the HR professional thinking about others' development that you really are providing opportunities for all. And, you know, we used to be a little, there was a phase there maybe in the 80s and 90s where it was all about oh, finding the diamonds in the rough and finding the top talent and everything was about high potentials and top talent. Well, now we have a talent shortage. We better be developing everybody because we're going to need everybody, right? They might not all go three levels up in the organization, but they're still valuable talent mm -hmm. and we have to create opportunities and we want those people, if they're performing, to stay and do good work. So my, those would be my two. You know, get out of your comfort zone and make opportunities for all. Would be I have three or four others, but I won't keep going. <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, maybe to try and uh, give a perspective. You know, we, not surprisingly, you heard from me a little bit earlier on models. We have a we have a model. We have a talent development model, and it's a 70-20-10 model. And quite simply, the 70% starts where Pam started, which was it starts with the work. So most development that 70% of that core comes from people's work experiences. So why is it important to get people experiences, right? Go back to that learning and growing piece. Well, the best elements of learning and growing, the best components of development are in the work, so in the job. So when you think about talent development, that's, that's our primary focus. About 20% of it is that um, the coaching, the mentoring, the, again, get outside the role pieces that might exist. And, and that 10%, though, is the actual training. So if you just think about, the experience is about 90% of it. The job, the networking, the coaching and mentoring that gets attached to that, and about 10% of it in training. We talked earlier about um, differentiation as part of our talent philosophy at, at, at AbbVie, and, and the idea of, of developing all is certainly some element of what we do. But I also will emphasize again, at least for us, we try and give differentiated levels of development for our best sure. talent. And, and I think that's important still too. And I think people want to see that, that there's an incentive there, there's different levels of investment there, um, just because that's going to help drive the performance of the company over time. I'm going to come at it with one final punctuation on the other end, just to get you all thinking. Um, one of the questions that I've had for myself is, OK, we go to university for multiple years uh, to get an undergrad degree, X more to get some other professional degrees. Yet we at work talk about I have microbursts of learning and I can do these, you know, two minute podcasts and, you know, people are learning. And so I'm sort of saying to myself, how do I reconcile that? How do I really know what learning is effective, is making a difference versus just sizzle, a distraction, making people feel good, you know? back to the old Hawthorne effect, like, okay, there's learning, isn't that great? Um, and, and really trying to thread what has impact and what doesn't, 
And how do I know? Because the gestation period's so darn long on it, too. And so that's been a big issue that I've been sort of debating. And despite all the, and, and probably my academic colleagues will tell me, no, Pam, there's a treasure trove of things you've missed. But there's, there's really, there's a thread there to, to figure out because there's a ton of vendors that want to sell you learning stuff. And so that leads me to believe we're all eager to write checks for it, but I'm not really sure that we know. And Marsha's point is spot on. We have to keep evolving everybody's capabilities because customer expectations go up, shareholder expectations. But how is it we know that 10% is the right 10? And that bothers me. And that goes back to your question, I think, early that we open with is, what's on my mind about the future? Well, back to developing the talent, not just getting it and keeping it, but developing it. That bothers me, and I don't have an answer for that. So just to build on that, Pam, you know, this idea, again, of training or development, by the way, we can debate all day what the different definitions of what that could look like, but all in the service of what, mm -hmm. right? So that's the question that a good HR professional will bring to the table. So I have, you know, a consultant wants to sell you something. Do I know, do I know what to say yes to and what I, what I need to deflect? Do I know why we're now offering this program for all of our associates, all of our employees? Do we have intentionality? So I think, by the way, you'll have to answer for yourself in that moment, training or development in the service of, and the question or the answer can vary, but just ha have an awareness. I know why we're doing what we're doing. There's intentionality behind it. It's linked to a strategy, a business outcome, uh, an outcome related to culture or capability. Uh, it's not a random thing. This isn't about checking a box. Yes, we provide training in our company. So, be thoughtful, be strategic, know what it's in service of at your company or in your role in your company. Start yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Pam and I were talking earlier, there's a lot going on, kind of a, sort of a stream of excitement around, you know, sort of skills-based um, organizations even, you know, and having all this information about every single skill and, you know, great databases and people doing these badges and certifications to show I have this skill and you know I actually don't really care if you have a badge I actually want to see you do it like whatever it is like then you're really adding value to the business right so way back in my career when I was in consulting I did an engagement for um, a power company and um, they wanted tests you know they wanted skill tests for the different jobs and they wanted, they wanted to test their people answered questions, but they also wanted to see the people doing the work. And there was an observer checking off that they actually did it properly. You know, we've lost some of that, I think, in our, in our highly digital world, but can the person actually do the work? You know, that's what a skill is. You're, you're trying to learn in order to apply it, right? So I, I think both of your comments are so, sometimes we get sort of enamored in the concepts and the, and um, sort of the fads, honestly, in our field. And at the end of the day, we're supposed to be delivering for the company to perform for our customers and ultimately shareholders. And so can they actually do it? Like badges and systems with thousands of skills are all great, but are, are they actually showing up in the work and delivering for customers? So I, I think sometimes we have to sort of step back and be much more practical about it too. So that 10%, is it applied in some way, in a meaningful way, right? So that's just one more thought, random thought. Hello, my name is Holly Harmon, and I am from Cornell University. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted Show to ask, force. yeah, <laughs> we did, go Big Red. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, with this profession, especially in business, in the most stressful times of business, HR is there, mm -hmm. and we are, we are listening, we are supporting, we are working. Um, sometimes in the most difficult situations, I had my own first situation just this summer at PepsiCo as an intern, where in the course of a week, I fired three employees myself. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult, but it's also necessary. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is, when it gets really difficult for you or your team, how do you advocate for yourself mm -hmm. and for your team and take care of yourself and your team to ensure that you can continue to do the work and do it well, but you're also not burning yourself out when you're potentially taking these things home. Start. Sure. I mean, the whole you know, there's so much right now, you know, with the pandemic about wellness and self-care. 
but I do think HR was in the front lines, right? Like we, through the last two and a half years now, wow. Um, you know, we probably took the brunt of a lot of what was going on because we did have to make sure everyone else was cared for and they could do their roles and they were safe and and so on. And, you know, I think your question is a very, very good question. You know, I, I think it is a part of the culture, too. Is it a culture, a caring culture? Like, is it a culture that, um, you know, I, I can think of where I thought you were going wasn't that you had to fire people. I, I've seen you know situations where early talent in HR had to deal with an employee who was violent or you know threatening or something really emotionally very difficult and um, you deal with the situation but then you have to make sure that HR person's okay right and like what do you need can we get you any help counseling do you want to go home do you you know so I do think um, it comes back down to the culture and the leadership is it a caring culture is it a culture where leaders do put people first, and if there's a really difficult situation, are they um, are they truly concerned in offering resources? And uh, many of our companies and colleagues have, have doubled down on mental health and well-being resources to our employees because of um, all of we've, what we've learned, and, and maybe that was one of those things that was a silver lining in this horrible pandemic we've gone through is that I think it's woken us up to something that was already there as a crisis in our society, but we weren't, for some reason, was a stigma or we weren't talking about it. But I do think for HR, it's, it's, it's true. They're stressful jobs and not every day, you know, but there are times where they're very stressful. And, and you know, to your point, the most difficult situations usually involve people, right? The most difficult situations in companies usually involve people, ergo HR, right? So we are in many ways in the middle of the most challenging situations. All of us had to decide, you know, in March, April of 2020, do we do layoffs? Do we do furloughs? What do we do? You're affecting people's livelihood. You're affecting their life, their, their sense of purpose. Those are big decisions. So even at the senior level, you know, you don't take those things lightly and they're stressful really really stressful or when you're in a big downturn we've all been in we've all worked through the recession and you know you did bear stern with financial crisis and um i think you know your own self-care is super important i would say um I, I will tell you a lot of very ambitious people forget about that for a while thinking i'm just gonna you know charge ahead and get to my goals and then i'll worry about self-care well doesn't work like that, right? You have to, you have to stay resilient and charged to get to your goals. You have to integrate it into your routines and your lifestyle, and you know whether it's whatever works for you. But we know we know what it looks like, right? Exercise, nutrition, sleep. You know we know what it is. But are you really holding up the mirror and saying I'm doing it? And as you become a leader, you're you're also modeling that for others, right? Not only how you behave, but how do you allow them to have an integrated life and take care of the other things in their lives so that they feel good and don't feel stressed? You know, so I think there's two sides: how you live your own life, and then and modeling it for others, but also supporting others to do those things. I do think the other silver lining is the flexibility we've learned um, through the pandemic. I think allows people opportunities to do more self-care because it's it's not as much by the clock, right? You know, it's more get your work done and, and you know, then it gives you time to do the other things to take care of yourself. But I do think for HR, it's it's been difficult. And all the data I've seen is, you know, not only is the turnover high, but the, um, you know, sense of, of stress and dissatisfaction's definitely gone up in the function. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe even more. I was just talking to a couple people that said, yeah, HR's engagement is lower than some of the other functions because we've been in this, like, really frontline, heated situation for a long period. Of we all thought it would be quick, but it wasn't quick, right? So. Mm -hmm. I, the only thing, I guess, is, is that reality check because um, everything Marcia said is so spot on. And... The beautiful thing for your generation versus mine is there's a different societal expectation, thankfully, where people believe in giving themselves more freedom to put a pause in it. Um, 
I think there were layers of it when I was earlier in my career. Uh, I didn't get married till I was in my 30s, um, for example. And so lots of times I worked with a lot of men who were married and, oh, my wife will kill me if I don't get home, these powerful wives. Um, and you know, so I would be left working because they would go home because their wife would kill them uh, if they didn't. And so there can be layers of, of things that kind of come on you. I, I feel like today people are much better at asserting some corridors for themselves, but that's something that you have to you have to constantly think about. And, and it wasn't until probably about 15 years ago that at the end of the year, I would always try to take stock personally. Am I happy with like how I'm living my life? Am I a good spouse? Am I a good friend? Am I a good neighbor? Am I a good relative? Am I a good daughter? All of those things to really start to think more about it. Because look, you can't be great at everything. And we all want to do that, right? We don't want to not be. Um, and so you have to be okay knowing there's going to be times when you're just going to go out around. Early days of pandemic, all of us, I'm sure, 2020, it was seven days a week, all day long, all evening long, thinking, what should we do that we're not doing? What do we do? How do we read and consume and become virologists, et cetera, et cetera? What should we be, right? And so there are moments when it's going to happen. So, And by the way, how misguided that you have Aquafina. Now I understand that you work for Pepsi, because I noticed that we had oh. Diet Coke, <laughs> and there's these Aquafina <laughs> bottles, OK? I was. There you go. All right, good. So come to, you know, come to the light. Come green. Come be green now, okay? You were blue. Come be green. So That's anyway, funny. I have to tease. Good advice from both, as usual. <laughs> Look, I think I, I absolutely believe, we talked about this a little bit earlier, like where you work matters, okay? Like I said, this is going to be an enormous opportunity for all of you. Like from a, think of the evolution of this function. This is a great time. Really, a great time to be in human resources, a great time to start a career. You'll have enormous opportunity, and you'll have some challenges. There are, like I said, more help that you're going to get extra than you've ever had before, so you have to be good in that space. But what it should say to you is, well, with all this opportunity, where do I choose to spend my time? So let's think of it professionally. I think you should care about and have a sense of pull for the company you work for, for the industry that you're in for the culture that you have a chance to create. I think all that really matters. I'd put a high premium on that. When things got tough in 2020, again, where were you? What was the culture like? What was the environment like? Did it feel like, A, this is really difficult? Yes, I did. But did I also feel really fortunate and blessed to be where I was? Yes, I did. And I just think, encourage yourself to make that a priority for you. And the other thing, and, I'll, and, and both Marcia and Pam said it, look, companies will take all your time. It's not intentional. There's just always something more to do. You have to have a life outside of work. You have to prioritize that. I, from day one, have said, I'm, my kids have something, I'm going, right? It might have been a, back when they were in grade school, a, a, a musical show at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, who has a musical show at 10 o'clock in the morning? But I'm going to be there. And uh, I don't care what it is. Like, I always prioritize that. I've not regretted that for one second. So have those things that sharpen your saw. That's my third covey of the day. I'm just going to for you scorekeepers. Uh -huh. I've been really giving out covey today, but I, um, I think there's some good stuff in there. But you have to be able to make that work. You have to have this thing that energizes you and motivates you, and you know whether it's uh, whatever it is for you. Know what gives fills your bucket. Know what your priorities are. Uh, you will have enormous opportunity. That's not your challenge. You will have opportunity. But find those things that give you enjoyment at work, in the right environment, to be your best self at work. But also, know those things that you go to, your friends, your family, whatever your things are that fill your bucket, and make sure you prioritize that. And Chip, uh, before Jim, I'll ask a question. Um, I was on your weekend uh, work rules interesting. Can you share that with everybody? Sure. I, um, and part of it was my own uh, annoyances with others. But you know, we, we talk about, again, there's always work to be done. So I have a philosophy that, um, and Tara's back there, you can you know, say thumbs up or thumbs down, but my belief is that you shouldn't be emailing people on weekends, okay? You just shouldn't. Do any of you, work, don't raise your hand, you're gonna start working for some people that are gonna do that to you. You know, they're, they're wondering about something via a text string on a Saturday morning, you're like, good God, people, get a life. Um, or look, if it's really important, then I know that it's really important because you don't. So don't make it your habit, your practice. For those that you work for, but for people when they work for you. 
Nights and weekends are for other things. Now, Pam and Marsha would tell you too, for the roles that we have, we're gonna spend more nights and more weekends doing work at different times. So that's about volume and about catching up. But don't make nights and weekends emails to your staff, uh, texting back and forth. Give people space. Bring your list in Monday morning, right? And for the very, very unique times or something's on fire, usually quite literally, then you know that it's that important. So give people the space. Uh, thank you. My name is Denzel Walls. I'm a second year at University of South Carolina. Tim, you began to touch on this a little bit, but I think it's safe to say that everyone in here has goals and passions outside of uh, HR. So my question for you all is, what advice would you give to maintaining those aspirations while also growing in your career? Just do it. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, if it's important to you, make time and space on your calendar for it, you know, whether um, I was thinking, Tim, you know, very similar to Tim, you know, I, you know, I can't say I went to everything that my kids, you know, all their activities and so forth, but if it was the important game or the important recital or, you know, something you knew was important to them, you just figured out a way to do it. and. If you're in a company or have a manager who doesn't appreciate that, you go find another company, right? Like, so, um, but you can't do it every day, right? You can't do it every day. But I think, you know, just do it, make time. You know, if you're, uh, and you had people working for me that were really competitive, you know, runners, you know, marathon, et cetera, and, you know, they had, they, they obviously had to train to do the New York Marathon or whatever. And, I thought that was so cool, you know, go do it. It's really great, you know, and so maybe they'd leave at four o'clock so there was enough sunlight to, to go run or whatever. But I, I think that, again, I think it is a different world. I think it's companies in general are more accepting that people have full lives. You know, if you're doing great in your job, you've got a lot of leeway. Don't think you don't. Like if you're great, your talent that we want to develop and everything we've talked about, right? So. You know, if you need to have more flexibility to take care of other things in your life, if you're doing great at your job, you're going to get that flexibility. Don't be shy about it, like, because you're hopefully you'll be a top performer, and your manager will want you to to do whatever fulfills you, so you can continue to do great at work. So just do it. Steal from Nike. Steal from Nike. I used to. Uh, um I should tell my wife, this is a terrible, now we're talking spouse stories, um, <laughs> that it was really important uh, that, 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 my, that my physical and mental wellness was a really important factor uh, and uh, that I wanted to spend time prioritizing it. Now, how you enter that conversation is really important, but my, 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 my point was intentionality, which we talked about a little bit. So one thing I would suggest is make it okay to talk about what your, ex your extracurricular activities are, what interests you, what fills your bucket with either friends, family, whoever it might be. But I'd also say too, what I, what I learned is that I needed to schedule my vacations. Just a little nugget, like, you know, the idea that there's always a reason it's not today. Gosh, and don't tell me about tomorrow. I got a list for tomorrow. But be intentional about what I was gonna be doing. And what it usually allowed me to do was to really carve out that time because again, there's always gonna be reason not to go. So to carve out the time, but also to think bigger. So it became more fun, like, oh, I took better vacations. So I actually took vacations and they were better. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of, you, know, you think about the year, you put goals together for the year. How about some goals for what your personal development is? How about some goals for what your vacations might look like? Mm -hmm. you know, I think that can be, again, just as important. There was a training program that uh, we had done at one place I worked and it was, um, targeted at women, um, and we asked the women to come in and share some of their learnings and experiences, and uh, one of the women got a room full of largely men sort of tearing up when she talked about the fact that she worked in a heavily male-dominated setting in manufacturing, and she wanted to be able to show up that she was as tough and she could work as hard, and so she had her first child, and she bounced right back, and she came to work, and she did things, and so she used to love running. She stopped running because she wanted to devote the time to be home to be with the child and make sure she was going to still be a good wife. 
and then she stopped doing reading that she really loved, and then she stopped doing socializing events with her friends, and then she stopped. And the program that we sent her to, the signature program, mm -hmm. got her thinking about the, the circle of her life and how she needed to take care of herself, and she needed to give herself permission. And so she started to carve out just one hour to go running at night. And that led to other things. And oh, by the way, she found she was more productive, that she felt better about herself, that she all of a sudden was doing even better at work, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have to recognize those moments, like Tim said. And, and it's easier said than done, but I love that you're all thinking about it, yeah. because thinking about it means it's a priority to you, and you're going to make much better yards than some of us have <laughs> over our careers, because you are thinking about it. So kudos. Okay, so um, we're out of time, and I do want to thank the panel, Pam, uh, Tim, and Marsha. Thanks so much. Um, and don't, don't get up there yet. It's good news. I do want to uh, channel Kevin Cox one time because we've, we've heard a lot about what's cool about HR today um, and why you know, undergrads and everyone else should want to be in the profession, and Kevin Cox, when he... Uh, teaches a class or when he teaches in the top seat program, one of the things he always uh, ends with is the idea that um, you as an HR person get to touch strategy, culture, and talent. You and the CEO are the only people in the organization that do that. And that, I think, is a cool reason that you should be in, in HR. So with that, let me hand it over to Brandon. Hey, y'all. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the MHR program here at USC, and we just really want to thank you all for taking the time to share your guidance and wisdom with all programs represented here today. So we want to present you all with these tokens of our appreciation as our way of saying thank you. I guess we're, we're played off, but thank you all very, very much. And we get to have some dinner, and I'm super stoked to see those videos that you're going to create, okay? Good luck. Thank you. All right, so I, I think, Anthony, you want to come up and give the instructions for the rest of... Oh, okay, Sandy's got a couple of things. Um, what, and before, Sandy, you can come up here with a mic, but um, before she gets up here, uh, do want to thank Sandy and Maz and Corey, who's not here, um, all the people that really made this thing go, so their round of applause for them. So. All right. Uh, I don't. Do you guys really need? Do I need the microphone? Yeah. So, oh boy, thank you. So I did get a call from the bus company today. Nothing bad. We have two shuttles. Or two